Thank you for your glory and your power and your spirit and your love and your joy and your peace. Oh, oh, thank you for what you're doing here, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, that's so lovely. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> what a delight to be here. I tell you, um, this is this is truly a divine setup because the Holy Spirit told me to come and it's um as Bo said, I, I don't normally um, accept invitations where I don't have face-to-face -face relationship. And, uh, yeah, my, my assistant wrote back, as he does with, with most that we get, um, you know, Catherine will be praying about that and be encouraged. And um, then he sent it to me, and I read it, and I thought, oh, I better pray about that then. And um, so I prayed, and the Lord said, yes. I went, really? Okay. <laughs> and I'm so glad I did. I feel like we found the set. We've got so much the same DNA. Yeah, right, and, right, you right. know, just I feel like God has blessed me uh, to, to meet like a spiritual son that I didn't even know I had. And so it's such a privilege, such a delight. And I just honor you. I honor you for the price that you paid for this. Yes. And I honor you for what you're incubating here because it's going to be good. This is going to be significant. I am, I'm standing around just looking at all these amazing people. And I want to thank you for those of you who've traveled to come. Um, and it's just ex extraordinary to me to watch and see. But um, I think uh, Jasmine was saying, talking about the importance of not uh, just having a little taste of an encounter, but actually leaning into it. And, um, you know, I often think about that. It's like when I first started to step out in the prophetic, um, I'd get excited if I saw a vision, and I'd be like, oh, I saw a vision. <laughs> and I remember once being in a meeting, and they said, pray for the person next to you. And I had a vision and I was all excited. And then someone else came in to the meeting and sat down next to the person that I'd just prayed for. And I, he said, what are we doing? And I said, well, they ask us to pray for each other. So he prayed for her and he had exactly the same vision that I'd had. I was so encouraged. But then he had this much more information. And so afterwards I tackled him and I said, excuse me, um, you and I, we had the same vision, but you had all this more detail. I said, how did you get that? And he said, oh, uh, well, I, I, I guess I, I asked. I thought, oh, what a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, often with the Lord, we get excited because we've seen something or we've tasted something. And it's a little bit like Moses when he saw the burning bush. But... But, you know, can you imagine if Moses saw the burning bush and then just ran home and told his wife, I saw a burning bush. It was amazing. It wasn't being consumed. It must have been God. It must have been God. And, you know, we, we can get a little bit like that with encounters without realizing, you know, the scripture says that um, Moses turned aside to see this bush that was burning. And it's in the turning aside. It's actually not just recognizing, oh, my goodness, that was God, but turning aside to give it your attention wow. and to give it your focus because it was in turning aside that he was commissioned. Wow. Wow. Right. That's such and, you know, I believe that in these encounters, it's not just so that we get excited that, right. yeah. well, that really was God, wow. but because God has commissions for us. God has, there's always a purpose. There's always fruit that he wants to bring out of these encounters. So I tell you, Truly, this blesses my heart, the way you are giving yourselves to turn aside. And, you know, to, to those who, who aren't in, uh, in the spirit, it can look foolish and think, why would they do that? But the scripture tells us that, that this is what it will look like. It will seem like foolishness to those that don't know the Holy Spirit. But uh, for those that do, it is life. And it's wow. glorious. So I'm so, so, so happy to be here. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, I've brought a beautiful friend with me, as well as my two very beautiful daughters, little Emily's over there. Hello, Emily. Um, she's so beautiful. And, um, and Jessica, I think, is still jet lagging a little bit. She's 
it back at, and uh, she'll probably be here tonight. Uh, but they're traveling with me. That's their sort of they have birthdays around the same time, so we're celebrating. We're actually going to New York next Monday. We're going on Monday. Yeah. And then, um, so we've got a few days there, and then we're spending the following next weekend um, doing a conference in New London in Connecticut with Brian Simmons, who some of you may know of the Passion Translation. He's a very dear friend of ours. So I'm doing a conference over there in uh, Connecticut. Haven't been there before. That'll be fun. Praise the Lord. So, yay. Just a, a thrill. But I have um, also with me uh, Sheila Williams. Pastor Sheila is from one of our churches that we have in um, Georgia, Glory City Church Atlanta. And uh, so Pastor Tony Thompson, senior pastor there, and, and uh, Sheila and her husband are the senior associates. But Sheila is also like my right-hand man. She she and I have had adventures. And, uh, you know, where I go, she goes. <laughs> it's just lovely because she's such an incredible support to me, but also has an amazing ministry when it comes to healing and, um, and, and particularly uh, healing of the heart and things that are just incredible insight. Um, I have ministry uh, with Sheila once a year just to have a heart checkup um, because it's, she's just a safe place, but also very wise, very discerning. So it's a thrill to have her here. But why don't you come and say hello, Sheila? Give her a hand as she comes. Thank you so much for coming up to Well, you can see why, where she goes, I go, right? You just, you just can't help but love um, Catherine, Pastor Catherine, and she is just amazing. And you guys carry a lot of the same joy that she carries, which is just, you know, it's just contagious. And, and I love it here. Like she said, it's like, it's like being at home. But um, because she's so awesome, you want to take her home. And, and I get to do that every now and then. But you guys can do it in a different way. You can take her book home because this book is really life transforming. It is. I have given it to so many people, and you know, there's so many testimonies of how God has healed them through this book. Because the title is Living in the Miraculous How God's Love is Expressed Through the Supernatural. But it's not just about, you know, how to get the supernatural things to happen, it's, it's her life story. And you know, you don't get to this place without paying a price, amen? Yeah, yeah. And so you hear the stories, you, you read the stories, and it's just awesome. I can't say enough about it. And then she has this also wonderful CD series, which is a set of um, seven teachings in here. One of my favorites is No Condemnation. You know, Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And... But how many times does the enemy try to lie and tell you, oh, you know, what you did in the past, that just sort of disqualifies you. You can't step up to that position. That would not be a good idea. And, you know, all those other things that you hear. And this CD, you know, if you ever have any of those thoughts and you hear that little voice in the back of your, you know, sitting on your shoulder, this CD is what you need because it's just awesome. There are others in here about having a rock-solid faith, um, being an overcomer. You know, you have to learn how to overcome and get past those things because Jesus has already forgotten them. It's a done deal. And so these, you want to, you know, buy them, put them in your iTunes and just listen to them over and over and over again. And just let it get in your heart and your spirit because, uh, like I said, once you hear her, you're going to want to take her home. So that's the way you can do it. But um, I am so privileged to be with her and um, love every minute. Is it cash only or debit um, as well? We can arrange that to happen. If you if you can do a check or cash, that's great. But okay. if not, let me know. Um, I'll have to go to my room and get a thing. But we can we can make that happen. Okay. So, I can help too. I can help okay, you. that'd be great. So we don't want anything to keep you from getting what you need. So. Yes. That's good. All right. Pastor Catherine, now you get to hear Yay. this wonderful Yay. awesome Yay. Yay. <laughs> oh Lord, we love you. Father, we love you. Papa, we bless you. Jesus. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I Yay, hooray is 
actually worship. Um, <laughs> worship is not just singing a song. Worship is actually a spontaneous response to the Holy Spirit revealing something about Jesus. And the Bible says that the Father is looking for worshippers who worship him in spirit and in truth. And that is those that will actually respond to the Holy Spirit revealing something fresh about Jesus and having a genuine heart response. And sometimes that heart response looks like a dance or a spin or a squeal. It looks like tears. It looks like... You know, if it's a genuine response to seeing a new facet of Jesus, that's what worship is. Worship isn't just singing from a song sheet. Worship is a genuine, mm, I love you, Dad. That's, that's worship. When, it's, when the Holy Spirit, he, He's given to us to reveal Christ in ever-increasing ways. And that, you know, they say that, the angels in heaven are continually going, holy, holy. But it's, I think it's because they're continually seeing a fresh facet of God. <laughs> How could they not? Uh, but anyway, the unsearchable one that is um, mm, mm, amazing. Anyway, I feel very, very happy I'm here. And I feel very at home, which is really nice. Um, I love your team, Bo. They are beautiful. I told you. Oh, oh so lovely. You, Joshua. You. Oh, wow. The hand of God is so on you. So on you. Just... <laughs> You know, I really need that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come here. That would be good. You know, I just, someone should stand behind him because it's a bit dangerous. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit just, he highlighted you to me and just said that there's such a strong anointing upon you. It's, it's, there's an anointing, for, you know, I don't like to say, that people are like such and such or like such and such because, you know, every one of us are unique. We are unique. And these people that we, you know, our heroes of the faith, it's a wonderful thing, but they are our flaw because God wants to do more. Hallelujah. But the Lord spoke to me and he just... He just highlighted you, like Reese Howells, like an intercessor. And, uh, the Lord said, too, that you're going to have liquid prayers, that there's just going to be liquid prayers. There'll be times that you weep and you don't even know why. You don't feel sad. You don't even know. But the Lord's hijacking your tears as liquid prayers. But the Lord says that there's an anointing upon you because you are a friend of God. And he says he reveals his secrets to his servants. And But I call you friends. And the Lord says that he's anointed you as a prophet. And the Lord says, you know, Cindy Jacobs often says that you can't be an, an prophet and not be an intercessor. You can be an intercessor and not be a prophet, but you can't be a prophet and not be an intercessor. And the Lord's been training you and giving you a compassion and a heart that's going to carry an extraordinary gifting. And the Lord says he's about to unlock it. It's like, you know, when people play those computer games, they unlock different levels. The Lord says that you've been tested and you've been faithful with a little and God's about to unlock more. And he says he's given you the anointing of a seer. And, and you remind me even a little bit of my friend James Gall. And that, that, that anointing, that, the seer anointing. But, but he says there's a uniqueness about you and you, there's a willingness. You're alert and aware and ready to hear. And he loves that about you. And even that which you've been through, I see that there's been... Um, yeah. And the pain that you've gone through, the Lord says, for your former shame, pain, and disgrace, there will be double recompense. Oh. And what the enemy meant for evil, God's going to use for his glory. And the enemy's going to be sorry he ever messed with you. Yeah. <laughs> many are going to be set free, saved, healed, and delivered, says the Lord. So he says, shall open up your heart, for out of it will flow <laughs> and Lord, we just increase, release an increase of that anointing, that sea mantle, Papa, in Jesus' name, Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
That's how you recognize a true father is they celebrate when their spiritual sons and daughters are celebrated, when they get lifted up. This is the heart of a true father. And you can see it. That's the fruit. That's the truth. Because you get genuine joy. Genuine joy. Which is remarkable. Even surprising to us. You know, I remember once I was walking around just praying for my kids and I, I found myself praying, Lord, I pray that they will know you even better than I do. Wow. And then I shot myself, Lord, really? I, I sort of shocked myself. I thought, really? I just didn't even think I'd ever pray that. And I realized the love that he gives us as parents is so, at so desires to see our children go higher and to go further. I mean, that sounds odd, but, but you know, the most important thing to me, to be intimate with God, there's nothing that would delight me more than to see my children have an even closer relationship with Him, to be closer to Him. And, uh, and that's the mark of someone that is, uh, truly carries the heart of the Father. And, you know, it says in Numbers chapter 6, there's a beautiful ironic blessing there. The Lord bless you and keep you. They say that um, Aaron, uh, the priests were not actually allowed to give this blessing if they were in mourning. They had to be happy because if they weren't happy, they weren't actually allowed to give the blessing because they were a representation of the face of God. And so they had to be happy. They, they couldn't be in mourning. Um, and then they were instructed to bless the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And you know that, that scripture uh, where he talks about the Lord make his face shine on you. It's, um, I was in Pasadena uh, a couple of years ago and I was having dinner with um, a few pastors and uh, there was a Korean gentleman sitting next to me and he wanted to show me a video of his grandson and this is a chubby little Korean baby and and he, I'm watching this video and his baby's out just like this with the big chubby cheeks just and in the background you can hear the grandfather going oh you're so lovely <laughs> hey, yeah you're so lovely. and the baby's just going like this <laughs> and I think it probably went on for seven minutes you know? <laughs> and the grandfather's like oh. and then all of a sudden the baby goes <laughs> and it so spoke to my heart because that's how God that's how God treats us he makes his face shine on us and he's still weak <laughs> Until we respond, you know, oh, just wow. <laughs> isn't he lovely? Yeah, when he lifts up, uh, you know, love makes his face shine on us, and he's gracious to us. Thank you, God, for your great grace. Isn't that nice? Thank you, Jesus. I am. I, <laughs> I'm just trying to follow where the Holy Spirit was leading this morning. It's um, I might get to the message. We'll see. But um, I've got time, so that's great. Um, I was just prompted when you were talking about hidden in the cleft of the rock, and um, it says in the Song of Songs, uh, chapter two, I think. For now is the time to arise and come away with me. For you are my dove, hidden in the split open rock. It was I who took you and hid you up high in the secret stairway of the sky. Let me see your radiant face and let me hear your sweet voice. 
how beautiful your eyes of worship. And I love the sound of your voice in prayer. And you know, the, the thought of us being hidden in the split open rock, it's um, the side of Jesus, Jesus who is the rock. He was split open and blood and water flowed. And we praise the Lord. We've not been born of, of We've been born again when we're in Christ. So we're not born of corruptible seed. We're not born of Adam anymore. But we're born of the second Adam out of his split open side. His blood and water flowed just like it does when a birth happens. Blood and water flowed out of the side of Jesus. And in Isaiah it says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And actually, transgressions and iniquities are two different words. Transgressions means our sin. And iniquities means our crookedness. So he was wounded to pay for our sin. So you don't have to beat yourself up anymore. He got beaten up for you. That's like worship. Did you hear that? That was worship. And he was bruised. That means internally crushed. If you look at the Hebrew, he was internally crushed for our iniquity, which means for our crookedness, the definition of who we are. He, he was crushed internally so we would no longer be defined by our sin nature. We'd be no longer defined by our crookedness. You know, as you were growing up, if you were you know, thought selfish or a liar or whatever it was, that definition was crushed internally. So you are no longer that person. You are now, praise God, born of the, the incorrupted one. Born again of Jesus. We're hidden in the cleft of his side. And now we are of his very DNA, which is just amazing. So we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. It, you know, it says, um, oh, it's so good. Hallelujah. I'm just flowing with where he wants to go here. It, like at the beginning of, of Song of Psalms, chapter 1, um, he says this. Um, that it's a, a dialogue between the bridegroom king and the Shulamite, which is a picture of Christ and his bride. And, um the, the Shulamite says, I know I'm so unworthy, so in need. And the king looks at her and says, yet yeah, you're so lovely. <laughs> and she says, I feel as dark and dry as the desert tents of the wandering nomads. And then he says, yet yeah, you're so lovely, like the fine linen tapestry hanging in the holy place. And, you know, the difference between how we feel, the Bible tells us, even though our hearts condemn us, he's greater than our hearts. We can get real with God and say, I feel dark, I feel dry, I feel this, and I bring it as a divine exchange to you, and I bring my ashes, and I receive your beauty. And when he looks at us, he says, you're so lovely. <laughs> But I feel like I just feel spoiled. I feel this. I feel that. He says, but you're like the fine linen curtains in the holy place. You are actually, you know, an entryway for people to experience God. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing in the temple could be even remotely defiled. It had to be utterly holy. This is what you look like. You are utterly holy, undefiled. And we go, but I feel, I feel, I feel. He goes, mm, I'm greater than your heart. Look at me. Let me convince you and convict you until you, and I want to convict you of your righteousness until you crack and you can't handle it anymore and you have to cry out like it says in Ephesians 3. Strengthen me with might on the inside so I can handle this love that is incomprehensible humanly. <laughs> Because human nature says, oh, 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 no, that's not right. That can't be right. No, I can't be right. It wouldn't even be right for me to let go of these feelings because I feel like I, holding on to these feelings at least helps me feel like I can pay for my sin. Whoa. It's pride. <laughs> so, he's pretty lovely. <laughs> Amen. 
Yes, so lovely. Um, in Matthew um, chapter 16, if you want to have a look at that, I love the Bible. Oh, I love the Bible. We, um, we encourage our people to memorize scripture. We've got some of my interns are memorizing whole books of the Bible, which is just lovely. And it's not out of a, you know, trying to please or earn something. It's just if you get it on the inside, the Holy Spirit can bring it back to yes. remembrance. Yes. And it's wonderful stuff. Shabbat. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Matthew 16, um, 13. And this, I just want to lay a, a brief foundation here. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you know, that's the place of conversion, isn't it? Where the Holy Spirit suddenly makes him real. Oh, oh, there you are. That conversion experience, which is different for everybody, but has to happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. Give me a wave if you've experienced that. Hallelujah, where you come to that, I know you are the Christ. I I know you, I know you, I I found you. You found me, I know you. Hallelujah. And he he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you but but by my father by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And you know, this is remarkable. Because he's saying, you're blessed because you've had this revelation of who I am. But he says it's, it's even more than that. He begins to call him. He says, blessed are you, Simon by Jonah. And if you look at the name Simon by Jonah, it actually means uh, Simon in this context is, is like reed-like, um, basically unstable. Wow. Um, bar Jonah, meaning son of Jonas, and Jonas, among other things, means a wine bibber or an alcoholic. So roughly translated, he was saying, this is how people know you, Peter. Wow. You are known as the unstable son of an alcoholic. Wow. Wow. Because he asked him, what do people say about me? And they, he, they said, oh, they say this, they say that. Mm-hmm. What do you say? Yeah. Holy Spirit gave revelation, you're the Christ. He says, mm-hmm. well, let me tell you what people say about you. Wow. This is what you're defined as in human mind by man. But I want to tell you now something. I want to tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I'll build my church. And Peter actually means a piece of rock. And, you know, we have been made in the very same substance of the rock, the great big rock who is Christ. And on that great big rock, the revelation that I am now part of him, bone of his bone, DNA of his DNA, characterized by his nature, on that revelation and on the revelation that, you're the Christ, you're my saviour. On that revelation, the church will be built. And the gates of Hades won't even prevail against it because they're solid. They're not, it's not just, yeah, I know you're God, but I'm hopeless. It's you're God and you have transformed me. And by the great grace of God, not by works, lest any man should boast, but by the great grace of God, I am now a new creation and I am part of the body of Christ, the same substance as you, hallelujah. And now God is trying to continually get us to awaken to this truth. I keep hearing the words fully aware, fully awake. And I just, and that's my prayer. I want to be fully aware, fully awake. You to wake. And I I shared with the team yesterday that I love to pray the apostolic prayers Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, Revelation, Colossians. Oh, it's just, there's so many. Um, But in Ephesians 1, 
He prays that we'd have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So that we'd increasingly have the eyes of our understanding enlightened in knowing him and experiencing him. Those who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. But it's in knowing him that we discover who we are. Hallelujah. Because it says, um, I hope you can follow me because I'm just happy. Um, it says in the book of James, chapter 1, Shula Bakara Basa. Hey. It says here in verse 23, Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And you know, I used to read this verse and get condemned. I think, well, that's me. I don't know that I'm fully doing everything that it says in the Word, you know. Oh, woe is me. I'm not really doing as well as I could. and You know, but that's not what it says. It says here, if you are not a doer of the Word, meaning if you're not doing everything that Christ was doing and more, because greater works than these shall they do. If a doer of the word, if you're not displaying the fullness of the attributes of Christ and the works of Jesus, he doesn't say, well, you just need to try harder and sort yourself out and beat yourself up. He says it's because you've forgotten what you look like. Wow. You're like somebody that's looked in the mirror and then walked away and forgotten the truth of what I've said, like what I said to Peter. I said, you're not that way anymore. That's not who you are anymore. You're not defined by your weakness or your sin. You're defined by the fact that you are now as I am in this world. That requires supernatural power to be able to comprehend that. That's why you should really pray Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. It's just like seriously good stuff. Take it deep. Because if you receive it and you get that revelation on a continuing basis, the love of Christ will empower you to actually believe what he's done. Wow. I think that's good. Anyway, hallelujah. So Second Peter chapter 1. Is this a good book? So good. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through through these He's given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world caused by evil desires. That is an invitation right there. That is such an invitation, and it's up to us to respond to it. He says, I've given you everything, and here's the key to it. It's through knowing me. Everything we need for life and godliness has been given to us through our knowledge of him. It's in getting to know him that we unlock the capacity, the spiritual, supernatural capacity to receive the love of Christ that will activate faith because faith works by love. That we can really boldly approach the throne of grace to spend time with the one that looks at us and says, you're so lovely. (laughs) And actually believe it. It's It's in that place that suddenly we begin to lay hold of everything we need to walk as he is in this world. Then he goes on to say, like he talks about all the lovely virtues of God and mm, just beautiful. Um, Verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. So he says, if if any of you are actually not walking 
in the virtues of God, the very nature and the character of God, overwhelming with God. He doesn't say, shame on you. You are rejected and not part of the family anymore. He doesn't say that. He says, if any of you are not walking in the fullness of the manifestation of the nature of God in every aspect of your life, it's because you're nearsighted and, and, and you've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sin and you're still living out of an old paradigm when he's saying, I want you to wake up, be fully aware, fully awake to the truth. But you are now no longer your own. You've been bought with a price and you are now as he is in this world. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> because if you start to actually believe that, every person you meet, you know, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think in your heart that I am, you know, I'm inadequate, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm selfish, or I'm lazy, or I'm this, or I'm that. And you think that in your heart, the next person you meet, wow. you're going to subconsciously be drawing from them, uh, trying to draw from them affirmation to wow. make you feel okay. Wow. And, and that deep need that we all have in our heart, whether we cover it up well or not, is eventually going to start pulling on people. But if instead you go and you get everything you need, that's why I'm so into daddy time. You know? yes. <laughs> Psalm 23, he makes you lie down in green pastures and he restores my soul. Because every day... <laughs> I have deep need. My yeah. deep calls out to his deep. It's so desperately needy for love. Nobody can love me the way I need to be loved except God. Amen. I have a wonderful husband. We've been married 23 years. You know, I'm, I'm blessed. But my beautiful husband, it, it would not be humanly possible for him to love me like I need to be loved. And, you know, people go from marriage to marriage trying to find what they'll never find if they don't look to God for it. Your husband, your wife is not meant to fill your need for love. So uh, you can set your spouse free <laughs> of that obligation. We're called to love as Christ loves, yes. But I tell you, we don't receive our needs being met from one another. There's no yeah. human that can do it. Yeah. Only Christ himself can yeah. fill us with the love that we need. And it's in knowing that love mm, that we get filled up to overflowing, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, filled with all the fullness of God. And it's not a one-soft thing. It happens continually. To overflow, you've got to be continually pouring in, yes? yes. Otherwise, you just get full. You're not overflowing unless it's continually pouring. So, oh, I need, I need, I need all the time. I need, I need. And the more I recognize my need, the more capacity I have to receive. That's why I pray Ephesians, that's why I love to pray Revelation chapter 3, that God would give me I self so that I'd recognize my need. So that I wouldn't adopt the idea that I'm rich and full and have need of nothing. But I'd actually recognize, I need, I need, I need. So that I'll go and I'll get what I need. Because the hungry, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. But those who think, you're right, no worries, I'm okay. You know, the banqueting table is laid before you, but you have no interest in going and feeding from it. He's laid a banqueting table before us in the presence of our enemies. But if you are filled up with other stuff or you don't recognize your hunger, your need, your desperation for him, then you don't go and get what you need. But the, the needy, the hungry, they go after it. Yeah. If you've ever seen a truck roll into a really a famine-stricken place, they're not polite in the way that they stand back and you know, wait and see if someone will give them something. They attack that truck and they go after it. And the, the reality is, they said it last night, the heavens suffer violence and the violent take it by force. Yeah. Yes. God has laid it there and it, nothing delights him more than you going and getting it and eating it. Hallelujah. <laughs> so good. Anyway. Hallelujah. Shalabaha.
So we got to remember what we look like. We got to remember what he's what he's saying and what how he feels. So the rest of that Aaronic blessing is uh, he says that um, he lifts up his countenance upon us. And the heart of God, I, I remember hearing um, uh, Charles Stock share about this, and he was saying that um, back in the 15th century, they were having a debate, a, the um, rabbis were having a discussion about how could God, who is most high, lift up his countenance upon anybody? And all the rabbis were like, hmm, mm, difficult question. And then while they were discussing how God, who was most high, could lift up his face on anybody, the door opened and one of the rabbi's little two-year-old sons ran inside. And just instinctively, the rabbi reached down and grabbed him and went, Oh, my son, my son. And all the rabbis went, He lifts up his countenance upon us. <laughs> and he says stuff like, greater works than these shall you do. <laughs> greater works than what I did, you gonna do. <laughs> Seriously, that wrecks me. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he said it's better if I go away because the Holy Ghost will come on you and you've got more than three years <laughs> we can just get happy about that <laughs> so we've entered into a season now that is, is pretty pretty serious seriously glorious <laughs> <laughs> I um, I head up um, Australian Prophetic Council um, back home, and um, I love Stacy. Stacy heads up the Canadian Council, and Cindy Jacobs heads up the American Council. And we've been talking to um, new prophets from around the nation, and we just had Bobby Connor with us, and and Brian Simmons, and we were we were discussing what the Lord is saying for the coming year. And uh, he's, lots of, he's always got lots to say, which is really exciting. Um, but, you know, in the natural, we're seeing lots of scary stuff. We're seeing the Ebola and the terrorism and people being beheaded and awfulness. And, you know, it looks quite apocalyptic and scary. But the purpose of it is to bring terror. It's to bring fear. And the more we talk about it, and the more we focus on it, and the more we get into fear, the more we're actually partnering wow. with the enemy's plan. The Lord said, I've come that you might have life, and life more abundant. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And for us to be focusing on the terror and the fear, and the, oh, what are we going to do, is actually being falling into a deception. Yeah. It doesn't mean we ignore what's going on, but we certainly don't allow ourselves to, to let it become the focus of our conversation or our, our thoughts. Because, you know, I've been, um, I've been really sensing for the last few months that the Lord has been, uh, it's like wrapping up a whole lot of things. It's felt like to me, I've described it as though it's like the end of a movie where all the little subplots start to come together. Yeah, right. And that's what seems to be happening. Uh, what yeah. seems to be happening. And I felt like when we hit Rosh Hashanah last week, yeah. uh, the beginning of the new, new year according to the Jewish calendar, it, there's been building for months in me this holy reverential <gasps> awe of God that's been causing me to pray yeah. Revelation 3. I need I of God. I need to see... Yeah. And I explained to the guys yesterday that, um, you know, if you look at church history, in the book of Acts, where Peter had walked past and people get healed by his shadow and wild and wonderful things were happening, um, it was a time of great glory. And 
you know, it also was a time when Anas, Ananias and Sapphira were happening too. You know, yeah. it's the serious glory. But um, over over the years, the move of God became institutionalized, and and man got their hands on it, and eventually, um, it was it became so institutionalized that. The, the powers that be decided that people no longer could be trusted to interpret the word of God, so they completely took it out of their hands, and uh, we ended into the Dark Ages. And, um, but then when you had people like Wycliffe, and I mean, I love church history, um, began to do translations into the vernacular, it was like, suddenly light started to come and glimmers of hope began to come and revelation and reformation and revival started to build and then you'd have uh, Tyndale and Luther and these amazing restorations of truth that, whoa, it's by grace, I'm justified by grace, whoa. I mean, that's, we still got to get that. Yeah. <laughs> we know that, but you've actually got to get that. You've got to have it, you've got to eat it, you've got to let it make you happy. <laughs> Please, Daddy, I'll not get it. Desperately need to get it. <sighs> uh, that's that's intercession too. Like, <laughs> get it. <laughs> you can feel the groaning in your spirit, like. Oh. <laughs> That'd be good. Get that. You know, the Bible says don't despise prophecy, and, and prophecy is not just. Thus saith the Lord. Prophecy is is as the scripture is preached, um, and as a prophetic revelation comes. If you actually and we can despise it by going, oh yeah, knew that, knew that, I know that, yeah, whatever. Wow. That's despising prophecy. Yes. And you miss out on the reward that comes. But if you'll actually take it and go, Sailor, pause and think about that. We need to do a bit more sailor, I think. Yes. Hallelujah. Anyway, praise the Lord. Um, so, so it began to be restored in history, and then, um, then you started to have like the Anabaptists and the, uh, all the different people, the revelation of baptism and the revelation of healing, and you know, fast forward. If you if you look at it and do a study of it, um, which I've done. You can see it in um, increments how these revelations start to get closer and closer together in time. And there's an amazing acceleration that's been happening through the last 50 years. And, yeah. I mean, you look at it through the centuries. It's like, it's like accelerating. All the revelation, the restoration of the revelation is very exciting. Yeah. And... Um, you know, since the Reformation, it's just been going. And we've had revelation of the Father's love, like for the last, I mean, I fast-forwarded, of course, you know, Azusa Street and the outpouring baptism of the Holy Spirit, the revelation of speaking in tongues, which I love, hallelujah. And the healing, the voice of healing revivals, that's why I love being here in Pittsburgh. It's so exciting, Catherine Coleman and uh, the amazing revelation of healing. Um, the Word of Faith movement, the revelation of faith, and the revelation of the Father's love, the revelation. Uh, in, and for about 20 years, we've been baptized in the revelation of Father's love, right? right. You know, since, since um, Toronto, basically, there's been a real strong emphasis on the Father's love, which I think is really exciting, because if you look at Ephesians 3, it's all about being rooted and grounded in the love of God, and I believe prophetically that that is like a roadmap for us. Yeah. That having come to the place where we have, oh, we're starting to get it. And remember, we continually get it overflowing. 
But straight after that prayer to know the love of the Father is the verse, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask, hope, or imagine. I feel that this acceleration of the restoration of truths is coming and bringing us to the place where not only are we coming back to the, the level that we were when the church was birthed at the book of Acts, Everybody wants to get back to the book of Acts. It's like, that was where you were birthed. That was the beginning of the church. And the heart of God is never to just bring you back to the beginning. Isaiah 61 tells us, for our former shame, pain, and disgrace, he'll give us double recompense. So the heart of God is not just to restore what was lost, but to really go over the top and give double for the trouble that we've gone through. But I feel that we are into into a season of a divine explosion where we are about to have lift off. And the signs and the wonders we're going to see are going to be greater than we've read about in the book of Acts. So you should get yourself ready. It's a time to focus. It's a time to really ask. God, give me myself so I can see, yeah, yeah. so I can recognize the times and the seasons, and so that I, I don't fall into the slumber yeah. of materialism and, and, and the slumber of, you know, uh, we've been at this for a while, growing weary with well-doing, but instead fixing our gaze on Him. And God says that, you know, as we, as we fix our eyes on him, he's going to show us things that we've never seen. He's going to show us things to come. If we'll look and keep on looking, if we'll turn aside in this moment and recognize that God is moving. Yes. 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 You see, we all know God is moving. Yes. This is amazing. You know, this, I can feel revival here. Because revival, to me, the way I recognize revival is my heart, when I'm in the worship, in an atmosphere of revival, my heart just comes back to that revelation, the truth that all that I'm made to do is to love you well. That's my only heart desire, is I just wow. want to love you well. When, I, when, that heart, when that revelation gets highlighted, I recognize the spirit of revival in the room. That's what's here. Yeah. <laughs> but, you see, if you read about a lot of the revivals in history, and, you know, you remind me of Evan Roberts. There is a real, uh, you know, it's yeah. Yeah. Re- remarkable, actually. And, um, but the thing with revival in the times past is many of those things that we see in the revivals, and the other thing is that this also uh, reminded me of the Cane Ridge Revival, which I thought was very exciting. But you should look it up. It's cool. <laughs> but a, a lot of the revivals that we read about in history, a lot of the stuff that was happening in the revivals is happening right now and much more. But the difference was they actually turned aside and gave themselves to what God was doing. Rather than just going, that's cool, that's nice. Yeah, God was moving. They actually turned aside and gave themselves. They went, oh, this is God. Wow. We're going to lay it all down and go after it. Wow. We're going after God. And, I mean, that's what the Moravians did. Wow. Anyway, you should read it. I'll just a little, put it out there. You should go and have a look. It's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty lovely. I write a little bit about it in my book. But, you know, if you study it, it's so interesting. Yes. And, you know, we... We can adopt the attitude of being rich and full and have need of nothing. Yay, God's moving. It's wonderful. And God's up there going, you don't see, you don't recognize the divine invitation that I'm offering. And I feel the jealousy of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. If we'd know it and we'd see it and we'd recognize it, we wouldn't just go, yay, that's nice. We'd actually sell everything to go after it. Wow. Like, I, I love how they were sharing about the pearl of great price. And, you know, the, the scripture talks, it's 
prophetically on layers. It's just layers and layers. You think you understand scripture and there's just layers and layers and layers and because it's living. And, um, and it can mean one thing and another. Like you read about this, the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. They were actually, many of them were relating to a current situation, but also relating to him. And, um, you know, the government shall be upon his shoulders, all of that. That was about a current situation, but it was also applied to Jesus. And so much of the scripture, all of the scripture, is just layered with revelation. And so, yes, he is the pearl of great price. So we, uh, we should just give up everything and go after him. But, you know, also, you are the pearl of great price. Because he gave up everything. Everything. So he can have you. Priceless pearl. The one that was formed in the furnace of affliction. Hallelujah. He's altogether lovely. Altogether worthy. (sighs) Anyway, I love Jesus. Father, we just say thank you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to recognize and to see. You know, the scripture tells us in, uh, is it 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 3, that we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of God. When we seek him, when we get to know him, when we go after him, when we make knowing him, Being intimately entwined with him as our one thing, as our highest priority, Psalm 27. (laughs) One thing have I desired, this shall I seek, that I may gaze Mm. upon the face of God. Uh, You know, uh, if we get that right, as we get to know him, as we get to see him, the Bible says when we see him, we'll be like him. And so he says, seek my face, seek my face. And then they say, well, no man can see the face of God and live. But the reality is, that's exactly right. Because it's no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you. And you become dead to yourself and alive to him. And when you see him, you you become like him. But it's a divine invitation that very few actually respond to. I talk about these divine invitations. They're like dinner bells. Like the Holy Spirit's going, Dinner-ling-ling here, look, food, really good. (laughs) And unless we actually get up and eat it, we don't get to experience. We don't really let it come in and become part of us. We are so spoiled with the amount of revelation that's coming out right now. It's just so much. But God believes that he has the capacity to empower you to receive it, take it, steward it, and be glorious and fill all the earth. Mm. But he's waiting for people who will actually get up and have it and eat it and take it. Wow. And enjoy it. You see, you have a mission and a mandate, and that is to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, because you, you are the ones who are his glorious ones. And he wants his glory to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, which is why it's so wonderful you're doing this. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And um, so, and we're doing the same thing. Has anyone seen our normal Christian life videos? Yeah, if you haven't, you can have a, a look. It's called The Normal Christian Life. We just take videos out on the street. We're putting it together as part of Glory City TV, which is coming out soon. And um, if you go to Glory City, our website, glorycitychurch.com.au, you'll be able to see some of what we're doing there, or um, you can look up The Normal Christian Life. And But the purpose of doing all of this, and the reason you're doing this, is so that we can we can cooperate with the acceleration of God, because this is real. It's it's happening now. 
God is ready to use anybody who is willing. Wow. Catherine Coleman used to say, God's not looking for golden vessels. <laughs> He's not looking for silver vessels. He's just looking for yielded vessels. Yeah. Wow. And it's true. I mean, I find it amazing. It, it, it's amazing. I was just a housewife. And um, just got really hungry. Yeah. And desperate. And then he started dropping invitations into my heart. And you know what those invitations look like? They look like imaginations on the inside. But the Bible says that he gives us the desires of our heart. You see, I love to have Bo shared that. Um, our imagination is a blank screen. And whoever writes on it is what makes it pure or defiled. But if we yield it to the Holy Spirit, he created you with an imagination. It's actually his that's his wow. screen. Yeah, come on. That's why you've got to guard your heart with all diligence. Because he's jealous for that. That's his screen. Wow. I've, I've got to be so careful myself. As, as you know, I, I, I'm more of a seer. I, I can't watch certain things yeah. without it sort of etching yeah. on my screen. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I've got to be careful. I've got to guard my heart. But he writes on the screen of our imagination. And, you know, I'd, I'd have these visions of fireballs going out over crowds and people getting out of wheelchairs and people being healed. And, and I'd be on the front ground sometimes just groaning and in intercession and, and like I was giving birth. And yet at the time, I didn't even know women were allowed to be preachers, you know. And it's like, <laughs> But I knew it was God, and he'd, he'd show up, and he'd, he'd write words in Hebrew, in open visions, and have me go search it out and discover, whoa, look what you're saying about me. What you're... It's, It was very exciting. It is very exciting. But you see, these invitations are given to many. Many are called, but few are chosen because few actually respond to the invitation. Wow. And these invitations come like divine imaginations. So good. You've had some of them. <laughs> and if you'll actually say like Mary, be it unto me according to your word. I take it, I receive it. You'll birth it. We have a choice, you know. We have a choice. He's given us a free will so that we can respond because he doesn't want he doesn't want robots yes he didn't give his life for robots he wouldn't wow. have done that if he was going to make you anyway <laughs> he did it to cause you to respond that the love of christ might compel you to love him back Whoa. to freely love true love is free you see <laughs> anyway, hallelujah. Isn't he lovely? Yes. But we need to steward these things, these imaginations, these gifts that he puts on the inside. Because they are not vain imaginations. If you're dreaming about people being healed, if you're dreaming about, you know, people people's lives being changed and but if you're dreaming about the world seeing and hearing the gospel through yeah. the gift that he's given you then for you to say oh you know that's just I, I don't want to think too much of myself is not recognizing that you're dead anyway it's not about you <laughs> if it's no longer you who live but Christ who lives in you seriously who are you to limit Jesus with your ugly false humility <laughs> it, you know that sort of humility is just a dress up of fear of man and the worry of what people will think about you if they actually knew you were dreaming that big Let's just, we, we pretty straight in Australia, we just like to call it like it is. <laughs> Who do you think you are? 
seriously, who do you think you are? People think, oh, people, I'm worried if, if people knew that I dream of this or I dream of that. But, you know, I say, who do I think I am? Well, well, who, who do you think you are? I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that crucifixion hasn't come through my own holiness. You know, if you tried to crucify yourself, you know, you could do one hand. <laughs> your feet, but you'd still have one arm flapping. You cannot do it. Some people say that's what the church is for, but not true. That's not true. <laughs> We're crucified with Christ simply by reckoning ourselves dead. Amen. And daily we have to reckon yeah. ourselves as dead. Yeah. Remind myself, that's right. Wow. That's right. Wow. I've chosen to embrace his death and resurrection. Yeah. I've chosen, I align myself. I look, I'm going right now, I look in the mirror. Yeah. You know, you don't go out, ladies, you don't go out without checking in the mirror, generally, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Some of my young guys, they must go out without checking in the mirror. They come out with their hair all over the place. Like, seriously. <laughs> but we shouldn't go out without looking in the mirror. Before you go out, you need to look in the mirror and remind yourself, ah, oh, that's right. I am not defined by my, the attitude I've had this morning. I'm not defined by the mess I made. I'm wow. not defined by my sin. I confess my sin and he's faithful and just to forgive me of all yeah. my sin. Is there anything going on in my life, Lord, that we, we need to deal with? So I give it to you. Yeah. I exchange it, divine exchange. Here's some ashes. In fact, I look, I look for stuff to exchange because I know how good the exchange rate is. Seriously. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I travel a lot and I've got lots of different coins often floating around my purse. And um, they just weigh you down if you don't exchange them. Wow. And we, we've got stuff that every day that we just need to exchange. And when we exchange it, we receive, we exchange our rubbish and get beauty. So we look in the mirror and we do the divine exchange. And we look in the mirror and we remind myself, we remind ourselves, that's right. I've been cleansed of my past sins. I'm not defined by my family, by my history, by my heritage. I'm not defined by my successes or my failures. I am defined by the fact that I am now in the made in the very image of God. I am bone of his bone. I am not born of human nature. I am born of the divine nature. I look in your face, let you, let you speak to me and say, I, you are lovely to me. Even when I feel ugly, you tell me I'm beautiful. And by faith, I choose to receive it. You see, you can hear it, but if you don't exercise faith, then it is of no use to you. You've got it by faith. I take it. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Help me to know it and experience it. I pray the Bible, Lord, let me be rooted and grounded in this love. Look in the mirror. Let him remind you so that when you get up and you walk out, the next person who sees you sees the face of God shining on them. And instead of you drawing from them, you are overflowing. And you begin to look at people and think, oh, God loves him so much that he's allowed them to encounter me today. Selah. <laughs> Pause and think about that. I hope that challenges you, but the, the truth is, like... If he says that as you are, as he is, so are you in this world? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Then if you are not expecting that the next person you encounter is going to be extraordinarily impacted by the power of God, 
then you haven't actually looked properly in the mirror. If you're not expecting that the next person you encounter is going to experience the presence and the power, the glorious fire and glory of God, then you haven't looked in the mirror properly. You don't really know what you look like. You are half asleep. You need to be fully aware, fully awake. The whole earth is groaning and waiting for the waking up, the manifestation, the revealing of the sons and daughters of God, the ones who know who yeah. they are. Come on. Yeah. Just one who knew who they were would change the entire region. We've been sleeping. The sleeping giant is waking up. Hallelujah. But I'm going to pray for people tonight. It would be good, but... Um, yeah. Father, let me just, uh, let me just pray. Papa, I ask that you'd come and that you would give us eyes to see. <laughs> eyes to see, eyes to see, supernatural eye self to recognize and to see and to know you, the knowledge of you. Let us become intimately acquainted with you that we might know that we are the righteousness of God in Christ because the righteous are as bold as a lion. Let them be filled with that Holy Ghost boldness. Let them be filled to overflowing with your love, Lord God. Help them to see and to recognize all that you're saying and doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't want to share too much more right now because I don't want you... I, to be honest, I, I don't want any of us to despise the prophecy because we've got to be able to take it and have it and eat it, to, to meditate on it and to, to, to receive it. And uh, so, but I'm looking forward to sharing tonight and I want to pray for more people and it's going to be good. Thank you very much. Yeah.